Um, yeah, just go ahead and, and your name and then what part of uh, OLPC you're involved in. Sure, I'm Jennifer Martino and I'm the director of One Laptop for Child Canada. And it's a core program of the Belinda Stronic Foundation uh, based out of Toronto, Ontario. And then what's your latest? What's the latest you have going on? Well, right now we have um, 14 schools in seven provinces and two territories, so it's, it's pretty comprehensive across the country, pretty good coverage. And um, we just deployed an extra 900 laptops, we're up to 3,600 laptops right now. Cool. And then talk about uh, those new projects, like um, some of the challenges there. Sure. One of the challenges we found is that we have um, two immersion schools. One of them, they, they use Cayuga and Mohawk. And, uh, and it was really important for them to be able to read those fonts on the XO and also to be able to type in their own languages because they have different characters. And then we have another school that's in French and Inuktitut. And so um, this summer we had uh, Daniel Drake come down to Toronto for a couple weeks and he put together a new build for us so that they could actually type in Cayuga and Inuktitut on the keyboard that's right on the XO and they built a brand new write activity so that you would have a pop-up keyboard that would be a reference when you're typing. Oh, cool. And then, I think I was hearing someone saying they had some cold issues with the computers or not, or? Uh, yeah, in Yellowknife, it can get really cold. It can get up to, uh, I think it's negative 50. I'm not sure if it goes colder than that. And uh, some of the challenges we've had with that is that when the students, in Yellowknife, they do take them home and they put them in their backpack. And, uh, and then when the XO is in a backpack on the ground and the kids are playing for an hour or so after school in those kind of conditions, then um, they did find that there was some cracking of the plastic on the keyboard. Uh, and so what they've decided to do is uh, just well, insulate them better, make sure that the kids have bags, uh, and then also let them know that it, if they're going to play, they should put their backpack inside first. <laughs> okay. So is that one of the coldest all you see? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's in the Northwest Territories. Cool. And then you have any fun stories about the kids from there? Or? Uh, yeah, well, I think one of the things that surprised me the most visiting these different communities is that uh, the kids are really into the physics program. And I've worked in Nicaragua and Uruguay and Argentina and Mexico, and I'd never seen children so enthusiastic about physics. Uh, and, and it was really neat because there was, uh, there was one boy, his name is Alex, and, uh, and he lives in a remote community, 13 years old. It was his first year at school, and he was living um, before that off the highway, so he didn't have running water, no electricity, and he was really good with his hands because they were doing things like taking apart and rebuilding uh, snowmobiles. And so when he came to school and he got his very own laptop, I mean, he really got into the physics program because he had such a great understanding of gears and and how to uh, put things together and make them work and he was making the most incredible things with that program and teaching the whole rest of the school how to do it and i think it's a perfect case for the xo laptop in a community like that because had alex not had the laptop he wouldn't have had much in common with the other students and he had never been to school so he didn't have the traditional school knowledge but he had lots of traditional knowledge from his culture and he also had all of this hands-on experience that the other kids didn't have and he was able to teach a school something new. Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. Cool, so what else is new? What else is new in Canada? Uh, well, we're ending, we're coming close to the end of our three-year pilot program and uh, and so what we're looking at now is the future of OPC Canada and where we're going from here. Uh, we just released a public service announcement and we have uh, so we, we got a lot of support, um, including from Gene Simmons. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> neat. And uh, we also have two uh, Aboriginal actors from Canada, Adam Beach and Dakota House. And Dakota House has come on board as a new ambassador for the program. And um, he actually is also a motivational speaker, and he visits a lot of the same communities that we're in. And so, um, so he's working hand-in-hand -hand with us to promote the program and also to talk to the children about, about receiving something because people believe in you. And this is a tool to really show the world what you can do. And uh, so, so that's pretty exciting. The um, public service announcement is on our new website. It's just olpccanada.com. And it will also be on television starting the end of October. And then we're just looking to gauge what is the grassroots interest in supporting our project and also looking for future uh, corporate and government sponsorship. Cool. And then how long have you been involved with all of this? Uh, I I believe I started getting involved with OPC in um, 2009, and I, it's only 2012, it feels like it would be longer than that. Uh, 
I, I started because I wrote my thesis about the impact of the EXO laptop on special education in Uruguay. And, and then um, I was lucky enough to do an internship in Uruguay with OLPC and I was hired right afterwards to go to Nicaragua and I worked with Daniel Drake there. And, uh, and then I just stayed involved ever since. And uh, in December of last year, uh, I was really lucky that a position became available to uh, you know, manage the Canadian project. And that's what I've been doing for the last year. Cool. And if your, your future self of today could go back in time and talk to yourself when you first started, <laughs> What would yeah. you tell yourself? I would tell myself um, to be patient, to be more patient, uh, and, and to remember that there are just many different ways of doing something. And then that's something that I certainly learned as I went through the different deployments, and I spent a pretty significant amount of time in a, in a few of them. And, uh, and just to realize that, um, well, in Canada, every community is so different, every province is different, and then you go to these flying communities and they're like other countries. And, and so I've really been able to use what I learned from working in distinct nations, like the difference between Nicaragua and Argentina and Uruguay, and then take that to, uh, to northern Canada. And uh, yeah, and just be patient and learn that each context is important and they're going to use the laptops in a different way, and that's really okay. The, the point is to increase access to technology among youth. And if we're doing that, then we've already got a check mark, and, uh, and everything else is just a bonus. Cool. And then what would the number one thing you'd want to say to people that like they knew about the laptop four years ago when it started and they, they sort of like lost track of it? What would you want them to know about how it is today? Well, I, I think uh, a big strength of one laptop per child is that uh, that it is still here, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a big check mark for them too. I mean, it, it's still going, it's growing, and, uh, and every country and every community is doing their own thing. And I think that was part of the vision, that this is a, a program for individuals, and that's why it's one laptop per child, and it's one program per country, and, and I think that, uh, that it has been a strength, that we've each been allowed to grow in a different way, and, and what maybe we should be looking at now is coming back together and sharing those practices and lessons learned, and, and maybe seeing how we could move forward as a collective. Cool. Excellent. Yeah.